again, thank you, Eileen and David, for uh, getting us off to a great start today. It's not good news, um, but the tr long term and short term trends and the inequities you've outlined are uh, front and center on the nation's population health agenda. We have eight or nine minutes um, before we can before we break. There's microphones in the aisles, and um, maybe in the meantime, if Eileen and David, it, it, could you come forward to take a few questions that would uh, be coming from the audience? So, if you would, please go to the microphones and ask questions. Uh, that would be uh, that would be great. Should we sit down? Maybe? Sure. Okay, go ahead and the Okay. And if you thanks. could just uh, state your name, please, that would be great. Thanks for your presentation. My name is Li Yang. I think the topic you mentioned and all the ingredients of a variable is all important. But basically, I think we have to look into the realist the problem of our system. For instance, if you say uh, employment, uh, discrimination, they will lower income and health status. And if you are thinking about uh, uh, stress and everything, you think about uh, black people sent to the jail, and now it's more important. The elderly, they are separated. I think you mentioned separation of family, but it's important. They not only separated. I think their income will be de deprived. And even the veterans, and uh, people like to say, as as a mental ear, but the problem is their mental ear sometimes are abused. What I mean is basically population is generally pretty good, but the system labels them as mental ear. And then we cause all the violence and then cause all the deaths. So I think all this trend will, will, will lower the life expectancy. And the same as if you go to jail, the jail system is in the condition of the total <clears throat> in the condition of uh, torture. What that means, they deprive of inmates, their sleeping time, and they are healthy. Then they take away everything possible. Instead of uh, let them increase their productivity, have a good employment, they just send them to jail. So all this is, is, is very simple to resolve, but the system is going the wrong way. And now it's a, they used PPP, it's a really mislabel, and so it's really extreme for a crime operation, and they including the murder, and the murder by itself increase, uh, what I mean, decrease the life expectancy. So we must use this concrete example and to fight this, uh, this, this nonsense of, of the taking away of our life expectancy and income and employment. We, oh, should, we have a lot could, of examples. Can we get a question, please? So would, would, would should we put this, our effort to reduce this life expectancy and increase their productivity and health and maintain their family income and happiness? We must change our direction to, to solve the problem rather than just use a statistic and nobody knows exactly what's going on. But it's very easy. It's very easy to identify. So uh, we, yeah. one, one we thing is, right, and we have a lot of data should be increased. For instance, we should know that the discrimination, the complaint, all those statistics, and the judicial system, those statistics, they are really dis hurt our society and hurt our family income and happiness. I would thank you for sharing a lot of information with us, and you are talking about important issues that need to be addressed. Thank you. No, right. Hi, this is a, this is David Desai from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Um, one of the, the blessings of America is the federal system where we have the ability to learn from other states and other counties. I wonder if any of the, the upcoming research has, has tried to identify outliers, states or counties that have been able to, to control these trends? Um, I think there are outliers. Um, Chris Murray has identified eight Americas. They're uh, using geographic 
uh, areas as a dividing uh, uh, or categorizing uh, way, and um, they tend to be wealthy, or they tend to be in places uh, where health is better, for instance, Hawaii, or, or health behaviors are better, uh, Utah. So um, yes, there are places that um, do not have the same trends, but they seem to be very different socially and economically in their characteristics. I don't think it's some policies necessarily. I would just add that there is a wonderful resource. Um, Brian Smedley, Steve Wolf, and others ha have created uh, this wonderful website that has data on both health and the determinants of health across every state. And you can look to see where there are outliers and where their state's doing better on multiple indicators of the determinants of health. So that, that's another resource that could give you a, a clear picture of, of where there are outliers. We have time for probably two or three very uh, quick questions. So, Whitney. Hi, I'm Whitney Robinson from UNC Chapel Hill, um, the Pop Center and Epidemiology. I was really impressed by David Williams' point that um, you really need an intersectional lens, and even the idea of thinking about immigrant versus non-immigrant populations adds more insights. And so, what are um, variables that you think that we need to collect or try to stratify by and look at intersectionality when we're looking at a lot of these trends? Because um, I feel like I haven't seen the data. Uh, you know, that idea about the immigrant population being considered in that way, and I know sex is very important, race, ethnicity. Are there other factors you think are very salient for us to consider when we're doing demographic work? I mean, race, SES, gender, um, nativity status is a good start, um, but I don't, I don't think in any way, I, I think a lot will be what's the driving questions you, you have, but, but I would begin by looking at race, ethnicity, um, uh, SES, uh, gender and nativity status would be a good place to start. I would just add, it's only very recently that we've had life tables by education. Um, it's shocking how long it took us to get those, and uh, that's so much of the basic story, and it just wasn't there because we didn't have the data. On our back from Trust for America's Health, one of the things that's happened over the last several years that's been significant has been the passage of the ACA and the insurance of you know, as many as 20 million additional people. We expected that to have a positive impact on health. Did you see any evidence of that, uh, perhaps in variation between states where Medicaid was expanded and Medicaid wasn't expanded? Well, if you look at the map, uh, the states that did not expand re uh, Medicaid uh, would appear to be the ones that are doing the worst. Um, beyond that, I, I don't have a specific example. I know people who've actually investigated what happened in Massachusetts after a uh, change in the law have found changes in health, but um, I, I have not seen uh, more recent uh, things on all states. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think there's some evidence in Massachusetts and, and some utilization of, of some preventive services that were improved. I, I don't think there are dramatic changes in health, but I don't think I would expect to see dramatic changes in health given the, the relative small contribution uh, of, of medical care to overall population health. I don't misunderstand me. I, I certainly think everyone needs access to high quality medical care, but medical care alone is not a solution to the population health challenges we face. Let's take one more question. Hello, my name is Mish Matz. I'm with the Oregon Department of Human Services Health Authority um, Research and Analytics. And one of the questions that I have is looking of your presentations, it appears, and correct me if I'm incorrect, that maternal outcomes that we're seeing are actually changing across all populations and that the bias and isms that we see in society actually impact all populations. And so what are some things that we can do as agencies um, to see, to help policy-wise and um, practice-wise to show that when we see things happening in lower populations over time, they impact all populations. How can we make effective policy to re reverse that trend and how can we really 
show the connections between child health and outcomes on adult health and outcomes over time in more effective ways than we currently are. Um, many people, I think, now are working on the link between uh, early life, later life, midlife, late life. Um, I, in the last 10 or 15 years, that's become such a prominent theme. And I've, I'm in aging, but I am more and more working on early life and trying to determine how early life set up uh, your biology to make you age slower or faster. And it's, the results are very strong. I think that early life is where we need the most work at this point in uh, our country. Yeah, and that's quite consistent with my emphasis of, of taking the life course seriously. Um, in work, I don't know if Natalie Slopen is here, but in work we've done with Natalie, um, we, we see even in, in among adults, aging adults in, in the Midas uh, National Survey, that negative early exposures affects their biological functioning and their, you know, in, in late life. Um, but positive experiences early in life also have uh, a positive effect. So, so really trying to understand that over time and how they accumulate to affect health outcomes is powerful. The only point I would say about your question is early life exposures do affect um, adult health uh, for all individuals, but they're not randomly distributed. Um, they, they are patterned by race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and immigrant status, as we showed using national data for the US. Thank you all for the questions. Um, if I'm not mistaken, is there a break time now, or do we move on to the next sec session? Break time, okay. So um, <laughs> thank you, restroom, coffee, so forth. So thank you, Eileen and David. Yeah.